Um, Michael has been growing plants from seeds since he was a young boy with his dad, uh, taught him, and he's been doing it ever since. He is also our uh, container garden guru, so if you ever want to do your container gardens, and uh, he plants all of them that we have here, you can always bring in your containers as well, and he will get them done for you. Um, he'll be doing this presentation today, which is starting your garden from seed, so to try and help people get a start um, growing from seed. And then April 18th, he will also be doing vegetable gardening. So if you can take your plants, your seedlings, into the next realm and do your vegetable gardening, or even if you start your gardens from plants, you know, all of our vegetable plants that are here, we grow here at Countryside. So they are started from seed. We grow them all here. Um, you know, no pesticides, no anything. So if you're looking for good vegetable plants and your seeds maybe didn't do so well, feel free to come on in and shop from our selection thousands of vegetable plants but um michael i'll let you take it from here all right thank you everybody hear me okay yeah. yeah all right thank you for coming out i really didn't expect that many people to come out today <laughs> but thanks for coming um i just start my seminars by asking a simple question um you know we, we grow a lot of plants here um most everything you can grow from seed that we, we sell here is plants um so first of all i want to know what you people are doing here because you can obviously buy the plants already done. Why do you want to grow things from seed? Because it's fun. Why else? Cheaper. 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 Yeah. More variety. More available. More sustainable. More sustainable. So something to do with this terrible. Something time. to do while it's cold out. Okay. Yeah. Nice thing too. You can also track your plant from seed all the way to growth. You know, in case you want to be more of an organic person. Uh, you know exactly where your plant came from that way. So you can track you know, from, from seed all the way to the plant. You, you know what's, what pesticides you applied or didn't apply or anything like that as well. Uh, yeah, my dad was very cheap, so he did things very economical uh, and such. So yeah, frugal, okay. Um, <laughs> you gotta, I kind of I learned that, I guess, from him as well. Uh, so I, I started you know, growing seeds as a, as a kid, and I know it was just fun to as, as get your kids involved too as well if you want to start seeds. It's, it's just amazing, even to me still, uh, that you can start from something this, this small um, and grow something, you know, like a 10-foot you know, tall sunflower or, or six-foot tall you know, tomato plant in a couple months and uh, sometimes eat something off it as well sometimes. So, uh, so it's, and it's the enjoyment of, of starting things at this time of year. You know, we get a, you know, it's cold and damp still outside. There's not much else you can do in your yard at this point, but at least you can get things started in your mind and you're getting, getting things going to ready to go for, for your for season. So let's start with uh, where do you get your seeds and how do, where do we start, you know? It is best to start with fresh seeds every year. Um, so we, we sell seed packets here. You can buy them online as well. And uh, some people ask, some, somebody asked me already, you know, like, are seeds from you know, a year or two or a couple years ago still okay? Every year they'll put a, a, on the, a date on the bottom here. They'll give you a year of when they were produced. Um, you know, sometimes the seeds will last for a long time. I've had some seeds that are five, six years old and they're still viable. Uh, some seeds are not viable a year later already. So um, going by the date on the package helps and getting fresh seeds every year does help. Um, I'm going to go at the end. We're going to go over how to kind of, you know, uh, keep some seeds from, from your plants for next year as well, so that, that way you can keep seeds you know, growing. You don't have to buy new seeds every year. So you get them from your plants from the previous season. Frugal. Again, frugal, yes. <laughs> um, you can check for viability a couple of different ways. You can, um, you can put your seeds in a, in a glass of water, a clear glass. Um, most of the time this works in, in a way. Um, if the seed is viable, if it's still gonna grow, it should sink. And if it's not so much viable, it'll float. Uh, so that's one way of testing if you have some old seed and you're saying to yourself, oh, is this any good or not? Should I bother trying to plant it? That's one way of testing. Um, that isn't always the case, though, it, it just, but that's a general rule as to, as to how the seeds work. Uh, another way to do it is using a moist paper towel. Just put a moist paper towel down, put some seeds on, fold it over, and wait a couple days and see if any of them pop. You know, um, that's another way of just testing for viability, just to see if they're going to grow or not. The other way, obviously, is just to put them in the soil and see if they grow or not. <laughs> it's a simple way of doing yeah. it too. So, um, another thing you can always uh, just make sure you always check out first is growing seeds. You know, if you want to start from indoors, is it worth it, or if you just start them directly outdoors? Anytime you uh, transplant anything uh, from one pot to another pot, the ground, anything like that, uh, the plant goes through shock, goes through stress. You try to alleviate that as much as possible. So, if you don't have to 
start things indoors. If you plant them outdoors and get the same results, it's better to start things outdoors in the, in the situation it's gonna be in. Um, that way it doesn't have to go through that shock initially. And some plants just grow faster and germinate quicker. Um, it's easier to just plant out right on straight outdoors. So some things like some vegetables, uh, like, some, like some squashes, pumpkins, cucumbers, those kind of things are actually pretty easy to grow and very fast to grow outdoors once the soil warms up. So you really don't have to start those indoors right away. Uh, some flowers too, like nasturtiums, poppies, sunflowers, those kind of things. You can pop those seeds right in the ground and it's a lot easier to just grow straight outdoors. So you kind of hold off on those guys. Uh, but other things you want to start indoors because a lot of plants are uh, more tropical in nature. We do not live in the tropics here. We live in most of the Arctic, obviously. <laughs> Um, but it looks like winter is losing its grip slowly, so that's good. So the next page just gives you some ideas of, of top 10 vegetables and annuals and herbs and such. So we start from seed and things just to go by. The third page we want to go to then is the next one, is when to start these things. So um, I don't want to pick on people. There was a gentleman that came in uh, a, a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, I started my tomato seeds uh, about a month ago. I was like, wow. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's too early. <laughs> that's way too early. You don't want to kind of jump the gun and get things too early. Um, a lot of times, because you're just going to end up with like a wispy, spindly plant that's not going to be viable to put outdoors. We'll go over that a little bit later. The best thing to do is, is to kind of count back from um, the last frost date and give you like a, an idea of when to start a lot of seeds. So when you look at the seed packet itself, a lot of times on here, it'll give you an indication. It'll say, um, the use of germination, it'll say, start indoors six to eight weeks before last frost. Okay, when's our last frost date? May what? 15th? Okay, yeah. We like to say May 20th around here. It seems to be a magical day uh, the last few years. Um, yeah, it, every year's a little different. Some years it's early May. Some years it's... Uh, I've, been here when there's frost been you know even after the 20th even like the 23rd or something like that there's been some frost or cold temperatures um so around the, well, we'll just say mid-may is kind of the day that you want to start back from so that's your that's your frost date so you count back you know eight weeks that would be like mid-march that's coming up pretty soon here mid-march so that'd be a good time to start you know these kind of seeds if you want to start them indoors so and everything's a little bit different as to you know some some require 12 or more you want to start them now already uh, some are just four or less. Some, some take a really short time. You, want, you don't want to start them too early. You want to wait a little bit and start them in April before you get them outside in May. Um, all right, so let's get, let's get started with some of the uh, growing inside. So what we can do is uh, find different types of containers we can use uh, to start our plants in. You can use pretty much anything. Um, you know, we sell all kinds of trays like this. We sell plastic trays with different compartments like this. Um, we sell things like Jiffy Pots, like these guys here. We sell these, uh, these little tablets that you soak in water, they puff up, and you can plant your seeds in there as well. These are basically just compressed peat moss, both these things are. Any of these work well. Uh, they're all, they're both very good for, for starting your seeds in. Uh, I've, I've seen people use paper cups, uh, egg cartons, all kinds of things. As long as they have some kind of drainage, as long as the, the water has somewhere to go, you can use any of those kind of things to start your seed in. If you're gonna use something like this, uh, these guys, you wanna soak them first, just to make sure that they get a, uh, the, the container itself gets full of moisture, and then add your medium, or this is actually your medium itself in there, as you're gonna put your seed right on top of this guy, and it's gonna grow right inside the peat moss. So soak these first. Otherwise, um, you would use uh, just some you know, sterile potting uh, soil mix into, into here. You can use your containers from year to year. Um, you, if you want to clean them out, just to get, make sure that they're okay. If you had any issues last year with any type of fungal, fungal disease or anything like that, you can use a little a bleach solution, a 10% bleach solution to help to make sure that any of the, those uh, things aren't on there anymore. You can, and you can keep using these from year to year that way. You have to buy new ones. Again, just make sure everything has some drainage to it so the water has somewhere to go. Okay, what kind of soil do we use then? Well, we have a couple different kinds. Um, there's all different kinds of potting soil in the world. We sell a couple here that I would recommend. Uh, we sell a seed starting mix that's called Metro 200. This is their seed starting mix here. It's very, very light, very, very fluffy. It has all kinds of perlite in it, vermiculite, makes it incredibly light and fluffy. You want to have as, as light and fluffy a mixture as you can 
to get your seedlings to start growing. You want to have the, the nice start for them. This is our regular potting soil that we use. It's called Metro 360. Uh, and all our hanging baskets, all of our four inch pots, everything like that, it uses this type of potting soil. What's the difference? Okay. If you're gonna just start seeds, you wanna use something like this. If you wanna grow them on for quite some time, you're gonna use something like this. The difference is this has a little bit more of a, uh, a texture to it that allows the plant to, to hold on to more uh, moisture and more nutrients as well. <coughs> so we're gonna go over real quick how you wanna start your plants and what your intentions are to do with them. So if you intend <coughs> to transplant your plants indoors one more time from one plant from one tray to another i would start them in with the with just this this the uh, seed starting mix what do i mean by that okay i use plant i use planters like this to start your seeds in they're larger <laughs> compartments you can put a whole bunch of different seeds in, into one compartment uh you can put your know, entire seed pack into a couple different compartments and see uh, what grows not every seed is going to germinate so once you plant your seeds in here, my intention to, with this is to plant my seeds in here into packets like these. And then from this, I'm gonna transplant them up into a, plant, in a pot like this before I even get them outside. So we're going from here to here, you know, sometime probably like in late April, early May. I'm gonna go from here to here. If your intention is to keep your plants um, and you wanna keep them in the same container, and grow them on just indoors and plant them directly outdoors from where you're going, from where you're planting right now. You know, I would start them in something like this. This has uh, more holes in it, more, and I would plant, I know, a couple seeds in each one to make sure that you know, they germinate. In this case, I would use this type of potting soil. I would use the 360 potting soil. Again, because this will hold a little bit more moisture and it'll hold it more uh, nutrients a little better. So this is more of a long-term answer for something that I'm gonna have indoors for. Um, you know, six, eight weeks at a time, and I'm going to grow them on and put them directly outdoors from this situation. If my intention is to grow them, you know, in this kind of thing, in a container first, see what germinates, and then transplant them up to something like this or this, then I'd start with the seed starting mix first. So you have a choice there to do either way. Together. Doesn't really matter. The plants don't know what you're growing them in. <laughs> they don't really care. They're happy to grow wherever you put them. But I'm just saying, this is. So it's going to need a little bit more maintenance on your on your part because it is so light and fluffy. It will lose moisture quicker, and doesn't hold on to nutrients as well. So, uh, this is just a little bit more. It, you know, things that we grow, we grow our tomatoes and peppers, all our vegetables from seed right here on premises. We grow them in this directly, because we grow them in those pots. We sell them in those pots. They stay in these pots for a couple months at a time. What's the name of it? Uh, this is Metro 360. This is Metro 200. So 200 is seed starting, 360 is a regular potting soil. So first you gotta figure out what you wanna do. I have a question. Yeah. Could you tell me what the advantage is to putting it into the very light weight? Mm-hmm. Why would you want to do that at all? Well, the lighter the, the lighter weight the soil, uh, the better the chance the roots have to grow. The roots are you know, tiny, uh, fine roots, foot hairs and everything that they, they want, you want it to spread out as much as possible before you get them transplanted outside. Um, the finer the mix, the, the easier the roots have to go. You're just making it easier for the plant to grow. Um, other than that, uh, you can use a regular potting soil, it's fine. There are the potting soils in the world. There's like the um, miracle Grow potting soils and such, which you can buy out at other garden centers and all that. Uh, some of them I've noticed are very uh, peat heavy. They're very heavy and, and very thick and spongy, um, which is okay sometimes. They kind of hold moisture a little bit longer that way but then they also don't release their moisture when they should, and sometimes things rot a little easier that way. Uh, so what we use is a nice nice medium mix. It doesn't really hold on to moisture too long and doesn't really uh, uh, you know, uh, leave moisture that was as, as well you know, too quickly either. So once we found the, the right type of mix that we're gonna use, then we can, um, the idea is to get them you know, into trays like this. And what triggers a seed to grow? Well, the trigger is uh, moisture and soil temperature. Yeah. Yeah. It'll hold. We'll show you in a little bit here. I'll show you in a little bit. Yeah. It'll hold together. 
So the trigger for the seeds is going to be uh, moisture and soil temperature. So once you get a seed in, in the container, that's going to be your trigger. So we're going to add the moisture to the, to the mix. We're going to show you in a little bit. And then seed te uh, temperature as well. So you want to get it in a place the air temperature doesn't matter as much as the soil temperature. So you can get some, some heat from underneath. That actually helps a lot. So we do sell um, this type of a soil mat, or you can get them other places as well. This is a, a mat that you place underneath, underneath this tray. You plug it in. This one here um, is a simple mat, so it just what it does is it raises the temperature of the surrounding air um, 10 to 20 degrees. So your soil is going to warm up 10 to 20 degrees warmer than the area around it. This will help a lot in getting this, the seed started. Do you have to use this? No. But this is a nice thing that you can use, that you can use to help your, your seeds germinate a little quicker and, and, and more evenly as well. Okay. Once we got that, you get to the next page here. That's the check directions on the back of the seed packet. It's going to tell you, uh, you know, germination time, where and how deep, and everything, and transplanting information as well on the packet itself. So always look at the back here and just see what it says. So like this one says, planting depth um, eighth of a quarter inch, you know, thin to 10 to 12 inches, and then uh, it's going to germinate in about four to 10 days. So it gives you, it gives you an idea of when the, all these things are going to start happening. The seed size often determines the planting depth, so you can have larger seeds like sunflower seeds and peas. Those things can go fairly deep in the soil. You can just push those into the soil with your finger, basically. Um, there are some seeds that are almost fine as dust. So there's, there's those things that want to be uh, more towards the top of the soil uh, because some, it'll actually say on the packet there as well. So some, it'll, it'll, sometimes it'll say like needs light to germinate. So those things you want to just put on top of the soil and they're really, they're really fine dust like that. And certain seeds do need some stratification or scarification to germinate properly. What that means is there are some seeds that are with a really, really hard shell, uh, like uh, morning glories or one example. They need to either be actually rubbed with a file or you can soak them overnight in water just to get that, that hard uh, outer shell to break. Um, that's, that's the uh, scarification. Uh, stratification is something that comes into play when you have a perennial seed. Like say you saved some perennials from last year, like you saved some of your coneflower seeds from last year. They need to go through a cold period uh, like they do in nature for them to germinate this year properly. So if you can do that, if you can uh, keep them outside in your garage and make sure that they go through that cold period uh, for the winter, uh, that otherwise they won't really germinate properly. So some seeds are kind of special in that, in that sense. So then I'm going to show you right now about uh, filling your uh, containers with soil. So I'm going to use, I'm going to, um, use this guy here. This is going to be this kind of tray with a bunch of different <coughs> spacing in it. There's uh, 12 different pods in here. So I'm going to use the, uh, the Metro 200, the seed starting mix. So I'm just going to fill them up here. Like this. This is best done where you in a place where you can make a mess because it's pretty messy. So I just kind of push it out to make sure it's all filled up nice like this. Tamp it down a little bit, make sure it's nice and even, and you can kind of go back and fill in little gaps where you need it. Okay, now there's a couple ways of doing this. Since we're in a greenhouse, I use a tray that has holes in it on the bottom. So the water's gonna drain right down through the, through the floor. You probably don't have that in your house, so you're gonna use a tray that does not have holes in it. So if that's the case, you can water it a couple different ways. You can either take it over to your sink and water it if you have a, a nozzle off your sink like this and water it over the top, or you can water it from the side like this. Let's pretend like this had a, has holes, it does not have holes in it. I would water it from here in the side, water it, fill it up about halfway, wait an hour or so. It's gonna, it's gonna wick up all the moisture from underneath. It's gonna make it nice and moist. Yeah, thank you. Um, that way, and then you can come back like an hour or two later and you'll see uh, if there's any excess moisture in there, you can kinda, you can kinda pour off the excess. Just kinda lift it up a little bit like this and pour off the, any excess that's on the bottom. 
You don't want this to be sitting in water. You just want this, the soil medium to be moist. So in this case, again, we have holes in here this time. So I'm going to go through and just make sure this is all nice and wet. And so it drains through the bottom. So if I do this enough, you're going to see some water dripping out under the table, I hope. Let's see. So it's best to get your soil moist first because if you go sow your seeds first and you do this on top, guess what happens? The seeds all wash around and collect in little spots and all that. So you want to make sure you get the, the soil moist first before you put your seeds in there. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. So then you can pick it up and by the weight of it, you can tell, okay, it's nice and, nice and heavy. It's good and moist at this point. So now about seed sowing. Uh, again, the, the packets here are going to tell you about, you know, what, how to cover seed and proper depth and all that. So in this case, I'm going to plant, these are called calendula. It's a little, 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 little yellow daisies. I don't know why people don't grow these. These are really nice plants. Uh, little known plants, but they're nice. These are nice, decent sized seeds. I know you can't see from back there, but this is a nice, decent sized seed that you can put in the palm of your hand. So I just do it like this. And if you can get them into the location where you can space them out just a little bit as best you can, uh, just so they're not all clumped in one area or another. So I'm going to space it out across this whole section here, like that. So this says, OK, planting depth quarter inch. OK, you don't need to bust out a ruler or anything. These plants don't know if they're a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch deep or anything. <laughs> the idea is to cover it with some more soil just to make sure that there's a good seed soil contact and so there, there's moisture from both sides, from the top and bottom. That way that the moisture gives the, the seed that the plants to trigger the, uh, the germinating process. So once I get those, those seeds across that whole section, I just come back with a little bit more of the mix on top, cover it up like that. So make sure that all the seeds are covered. After that, what I do is I just take a, like a water bottle like this, like it's just plain water in here, and go over the top and spray it. What you're doing is moistening that top layer that you just put on that was bone dry, and the force of the spray is pushing down on that soil. It's pushing it down. It's giving good seed soil contact. So the, soil, the, the seed is contacting the soil from underneath and from the top. So it's kind of sandwiched in between. You can, with larger seeds, you can do that. Like I said, with peas and sunflowers and those kind of things, you can just kind of push it in with your finger. That's fine too. Uh, with smaller seeds, it kind of works a little better this way, just because it's just easier to cover that way and it won't get shifted around as much. So everything's in place where I put it and covered with soil. And now I just give a little spritz like this, make sure it's nice and moist. So it's moist from underneath and it's moist from on top. Okay, so and then, uh, Make sure that you mark your stuff. Uh, so you mark this what it is. You know, this is going to be Calendula Pacific Beauty Mix. Uh, grows, you know, 10 to 12 inches, that kind of thing. I write on here just to make sure I know what, what it's going to be. Um, if you're growing different types of tomatoes or peppers or those kind of things, make sure you mark them. Uh, because people come up to me sometimes out here with a, with a tomato plant with no tag on it. And they say, what, what kind of tomato is this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they, they all look the same. You don't know unless you, unless you mark them. So. Make sure that everyone has a, has a tag on it. So make sure you know what variety they are. So once you have your tray planted uh, and marked, then the idea is to put it on the heat mat. If you have one of these, if you don't, that's fine. But if you can use one of these, it, it, it helps a lot. It gives you some heat from underneath and it'll have moisture on top. You wanna maintain the moisture on top as best you can while that plant is germinating. So we can do a couple different things. We saw like a plastic dome like this, you can put it on top, keeps in all the humidity. Um, or you can just, if you don't want to use one of these or don't have one of these, uh, you can sometimes just use like a plastic wrap, a saran wrap. Or you can just, you know, if you tend your plants regularly, go down there every couple days, make sure you get down there and, and just miss the, miss the top. So that, so that it keeps the top misted. 
No, you don't. And I'm going to use this to show you real quick. So let's say this is like a side view of your, your growing container. So this is all filled with soil from here on down. Okay, you plant your seeds in here. You put a little more soil on top. Okay, <coughs> everything's moist. And you put your dome on top and you put your missing on top. Okay, where's all the action? All the action's right up here. There's nothing going on down here. There's only, there's just moist soil down here. There's nothing going down there here yet. So when it's time, when before it's, they germinate, uh, this is where you want to keep the soil moist, at the top layer. So it's going to be different later on. So once they get, uh, once they start popping and germinating, the nice thing about these types of containers is they come apart like this. So sometimes you have certain plants that'll germinate faster than others. Some will germinate within a week, some take a couple weeks to germinate. What you wanna do is once they germinate, once they start popping, once they get to, let's say, you know, let's say this stage here where they're all starting to pop, you wanna get them off the heat. So if you can, get them from this situation, you know, where, let's say you have your heat mat under this tray right here that's germinating all your seeds. Okay, great, well this one's already germinated. I'm gonna take this one off and put it over here in a different tray that's, uh, you know, off the heat mat at this point. So why do we do that? Because once the plant is germinated, it needs to be in a little different conditions at that point. And it's best to get them away from, from where they started from. So again, we're gonna talk, I just wanna go through the blister real quick before we move on. Um, so again, the moisture is the next key. So moisture, either we can use the domes and that, or clear plastic covers. Temperature is the key as well. Um, most, all, all seeds will, will benefit from that extra heat from the bottom. Um, some of the cold crops do germinate at low, lower temperatures, but they, they will germinate at high temperatures as well. So, But everything will, will benefit from that extra heat if you can do it. The next most important thing that we're gonna move on to is lighting. So once these plants start popping, okay, these I grew in this uh, next greenhouse over here in the last couple weeks. So we get you know, enough sunlight in here uh, at all times of the day for these to grow at this rate. Most places in your home uh, don't have enough light. Even if you put them in a, a kitchen window as best you can, there's really not enough light there for the plants to do as well as they should. You really want to get some extra light on it if you can. So my setup is this. I just use simple shop lights is all I use. Again, because I'm cheap, this is what I use. So you buy these shop lights at Menards, I don't know, like 12, 15 bucks maybe for a shop light fixture. And I hang them from, well, I do it in my basement, so I hang it from the ceiling. I hang it from the ceiling with chains like this. So I have a couple of them over a table like this. So I have one on this side, and I'll have one on this side. So that gives me four trays. You can put four trays underneath these two lights. So first of all, it's nice to have them on chains like this because the chains you can adjust up and down very easily. Where you want this light for this to germinate, you want it like way down here. You want it right on top of those seeds, maybe like six, you know, six to eight, eight inches above the seeds when they're, when they're trying to germinate, as close as possible. Um, as the plants grow, you know, as they grow like this, then you have the opportunity to raise up this, these chains as, you, as the plants grow to get them a little bit, you know, farther off the plant that way. So it's a nice way to doing it because you, get, you can adjust it like this. As far as what types of lights to use, you know, they sell all types of uh, full spectrum lights and all those things, which are very more expensive. I don't use those myself. Plants, for them to just to grow from what we're doing here, from a seed to a plant to a point where you transplant them outdoors, they only need uh, the cool spectrum of light. They only need uh, the, fluorescent, the regular cool fluorescent lights that you get in the store. The full spectrum is, is better uh, when you get the plant. You want to you get it to a point where uh, you're reducing flowering and fruiting as well. That's the warm sector of the light. So if you have all that, it doesn't hurt to have all that spectrum in your lights, but it doesn't really help all that much at this point in the stage of the life of the plant. The cool spectrum is all you really need. So just go with the regular 
cool watt bulbs. They're the cheapest ones you can get with a shop light. Um, and that's all you need. If you're, if you're planning on you know, growing plants and keeping them indoors and wanting the flower and fruit indoors, then yes, then you do need a, a more of a spectrum light to do that. But in this case, you don't. Um, people have asked me, I haven't tried myself the difference between LED lights and fluorescent lights. I assume LED lights would be about the same. Uh, they come into, I think they come in a cool spectrum as well. Just do the cool spectrum LED lights. They put a different type of light than the fluorescent lights do. But again, it, it's more so the, the distance is what the factor is. If you can get them as close as you can to the, to the lights, uh, to the plants themselves without about six, eight inches away from the plants themselves, it's the best way to do it. Every inch or so you go up, it loses uh, quite a bit of foot candle power and it doesn't have the, the strength for the, to grow the plants um, as well. Excuse me. Yeah. So how long would you uh, keep those lights on? Before yeah, that's what I was going to tell you. Um, I have mine plugged in um, to a timer. So uh, they're on and off by themselves. And so I usually have about 14 to 16 hours of light is what I do for those. The heat mat you can have on all the time. You can have that plugged into a different outlet or you can have it plugged into the timer. I've done it both ways and it works either way. Um, so. Is there an ideal time? You know, like you said 14 to 16 hours. Um, is it always the same time, you know, during the day or whatever time? Um, I just have it on, you know, daytime. You know, 14 to 16 hours, you know, kind of thing. It doesn't matter when you do it. Okay. Then the plant will, will figure out what time it is. It's fine. Um, it's, it's like June level uh, natural light. It's about 14 to 16 hours around here. So that's generally, that's a, that's a good amount of light for these plants to get going and do their thing. So, so again, you know, try to keep it as close as you can to the plants. What happens if you don't have enough light is these plants will stretch and they'll kind of stretch and keep looking for light and get taller and taller and taller. So you don't want that to keep, you don't want that to happen because the taller and wispier they get, they're tend to, they're tend to fall over and stretch and look for light and bend one way or another and that kind of thing. So again, the, the more light you can put on it, the better at any point. All right. So there's things that can go wrong, unfortunately. So sometimes there's things uh, like called damping off. And that, uh, there's a couple things we could do to try to prevent that. So when we plant seeds in a, in a container like this, uh, it's best to get things uh, spaced out as much as you can, um, or just thin out the seeds as you're gonna use them. So if you plant, let's say, you know, let's say you plant uh, 20 seeds in here, a tomato plant, uh, and the first you know, bunch are starting to pop up and there's a couple that are closer to each other or that and there's some like late and germinating and such um, You have to ask yourself. Are you going to use 20 tomato plants? Or do, do I need all these seedlings? You know, the answer is no, you want to you want to pick out you know, the ones that are the best You know the best, you know four five six whatever you're going to use and keep those growing and then the rest that are not doing so well survival with this you go through and you pick out those and you throw those out so the ones that are remaining have a better chance of growing. That also helps with damping off because it gives a little more airflow between the plants. If they're all stuck together in one spot, uh, they don't get enough airflow and it gets you know, moisture condenses in there and it doesn't get, um, get to dry out as much as it could. So again, the, the reason again why we take things off of the, the heat mat and off of the, you know, underneath this dome as best as quick as we can is because if you have the situation where uh, plants have already germinated and you have this dome over them still. Um, moisture is collecting underneath there. It's not evaporating as well as it should. Uh, at that point, you know, the, the uh, fungal spores and diseases can start on the top layer of the soil. So that's what damping off is. Do you it, put that cover over and then the light? Yes. Yeah, the cover goes and the, light, the lights are on top. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So again, so once we have the seeds germinating at the top of the soil, so once they germinate and they start growing some roots down this way and they grow up this way, now you don't want the moisture on the top layer anymore. Now you want the moisture to be down here if you can. If you keep moisture at the top layer now, you're inviting things like disease problems and such to occur. It's better to water from underneath if you can uh, at this point, so because you want these these young roots to go down here and search for the water that's down at the bottom of the container. Yeah. 
I have never heard that before, but you can certainly try that. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, the cinnamon may soak up excess moisture and may help with the, the situation. So that, that's a possibility. I never heard that, though. What, what did you, I, did you hear? She, uh, she put cinnamon on top of the soil. Never heard that before, yeah. It's an interesting one. So yeah, so once they, once they germinate like this, once we get them off of the heat and, and out of the, underneath the dome and stuff, they're starting to germinate and pop like this, um, you want to have more moisture down at the bottom of the, the container than at the top. So no more misting on the top anymore. So now we want to water, uh, if you can, water from underneath is the best way of doing it. So let's say you have a tray here uh, that has no holes in it, like this. I usually just, uh, you, you'll gauge it as you go along, but if this, this was full of, of different plants here, uh, you just pour water into the base or pour water into the tray and watch it soak up from underneath. Um, if you put in too much water, you can either just kind of tip it off and just get the excess water out after a few minutes, um, or you can suck it out with a turkey baster. I've done that before too, just to get the excess water out from underneath here. But um, that way it's watering from underneath. The top layer you know, dries out and gets drier a little quicker. Um, and you can avoid some of the damping off problems you might have. So damping off, what it really is, uh, you'll notice that some of your seedlings uh, at the very base where, the, where they meet the soil, they get really thin and it almost looks like somebody came along and chopped off uh, right at the base there, chopped it off a little bit and it kind of shrivels up and then tips over and falls over and dies. That's what damping off looks like. So again, spreading them out as much as you can, avoid overwatering. And another thing you do is put up a fan. Simple. See, pop a fan over here on your seedlings. Uh, get one with different settings. You don't need to blast down you know, with air. Just a, a nice low setting like this. And so it's just blowing some air. It's just getting some airflow across your seedlings. This does a couple things. It'll help with damping off. It also helps the plant's turgidity. It helps it get a little more rigid. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. How long do you recommend keeping the fan on? Uh, that can be on all the time if you want. Uh, or it can be cooked up to your timer. It could be either way. Uh, it's just getting a little airflow, keeping things going. So again, when we get, when we get to that point where we want uh, to thin your seedlings, um, Again, figure out what you want or how many think you might need. Um, you don't need to have as many plants as you as you might have as might have sprouted. Um, thin them out to the the ones that they're the the best can grow on. And at this point, if you want to go ahead, if you want to do some transplanting indoors, this is the point where we start doing this. So once we get to this point. You got your plant growing. Lost my chalk. Your plant's growing up here. The first thing that comes off each plant are what are called cotyledons. That's the first two things that pop up. They're not really leaves. That's what a seed pops up and shoots out is its first uh, point of generating uh, energy for the plant. It can collect some light and do its thing and send energy back down to the young root system that's growing. The next things that come up are actually the first set of true leaves on the plant. So once we get to that first set of true leaves on the plant, um, that's the best time to go ahead and transplant it into something else. There's a couple things, you, ways you can do it. Okay, so these are, um, these are sunflowers. So I planted these at a couple different stages. I planted these a couple weeks ago. This was about a week ago. This was a few days ago. So you can see how kind of tall they are at this point. So these are just starting to pop. These just have their cotyledons on them yet. And these already have their first set of true leaves. There's cotyledons and there's true leaves on there as well. So these are ready to transplant. So how do we do that? Get in a container like this. You're gonna transplant it up into a bigger spot like this. Or you can transplant it up into individual cells like this, depending on what the plant is. Sunflowers get pretty big pretty fast, so we're gonna put them in a bigger pot right away. Um, if it's just smaller plants or smaller flowers, you can go ahead and transplant them up into this as well. So in this case, I'm going to use the, the 360, the regular potting soil, and just pops them in here like this. I just use the, uh, the uh, label as like a little tool. Helps a lot. Just get up, dig down right next to the plant, underneath it. 
try not to disturb the roots as much as possible. And you're gonna pull it out like this. So you got your plant with your, with your root ball underneath it. There's a little bit of roots under there. You're gonna dig a little hole inside your new container. And push it down in there. So the point between the soil surface and the cotyledons, this part right here, you can bury that and it's okay. Once you get up here to where the true leaves are, the plant's gonna grow up from this point. You don't wanna bury that anymore. So this is your point from here to here, as far as you can, as you can, you can bury it into the soil and get away with it. So what I'm gonna do is since we're in this container like this, I'm gonna go ahead and put my finger down right next to the, the plant and push it down as far as I can into the soil. Put a little bit more soil around it. So right now, I'm right down at the depth of where that cotyledon first started and those first true leaves are popping out. So that's where the, the crown of the plant is gonna form and it's gonna grow on from that point. So now we're still indoors. So I'm gonna pop them from here to here and we're still indoors. We're still under some lights. We're still, uh, we're off the heat mat. We're just going over into this kind of thing now. Um, but it gives you the opportunity to get the plant deeper into the soil so it's not nice and floppy and as spindly as it could be. But if you use the cold frame, do you suggest can you put the whole plant to six feet off? Say it's usually the whole frame? Yes. Outside now, or would yes. you suggest moving that inside and then moving each individual product outside? You can do it in the cold frame, yeah. Um, the cold frame itself though, you know, outdoors it can still get quite cold at night. Um, so it depends on what you're growing. You know, some things that can acclimate, you know, the cooler temperatures, yes. Um, if it's things that, yeah, it's, you know, it should be enough light. Uh, it'd be better if you could do it indoors under some lights. I would say if it's things that need a longer time frame, like uh, peppers and such that need a longer time to germinate and all that, they're more tropical plant. Uh, I would start those indoors. If it's things that can take a cooler temperatures, you can go ahead and start them out there. Okay. Another trick that we do uh, here at Countryside is when we plant our seeds, is we don't go and transplant all our seeds uh, because that would take forever. Uh, so we start we start our tomatoes and, and peppers and a lot of other things in these pots themselves. So we start them right here and we put the seed in the pot so they get you know some spindly growth on them coming right out of the container. Uh, these are marigolds. So I started these in a pot like this. So they have their own individual cells right here. So I'm going to keep these in, in this container because they're in pretty good sized cells, but see how they're getting kind of tall and spindly. So they're going to be kind of floppy plants when I get them to go put them outside. So what am I, okay, so once they get to this point again where they're starting to grow their own true leaves, which is starting to happen on these guys right now, go through with your finger, put it right next to the plant, push down, push it down in there. <laughs> I will move a little higher. <laughs> so that, so that, that where the cotyledon starts is now down at the base of the soil. And you can do, the, do that with all these. You go around and push down, push down, push, 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 push. We've got girls that go around and push all the little plants down in all our pots. Um, that way that gives the, that gives the plant, the, the crown is, is near the base of the soil and gives that plant a, a much better base to grow from. Same with tomatoes. Huh? Oh, I did. Tomato plants. Oh, okay, yeah. Pardon me? Same with tomato plants? This is for any plant. You can do this with any plant. As long as you have that space from where the cotyledon grows down to there. So you just push around it like that and get it down to where that soil level is. You can see it. So that helps plants, you know, keep, keep it from being all spindly and wispy when you go to plant them outdoors. The other thing that helps, no. <laughs> the other thing that helps is this, is that fan over there. I assume there's no wind in your house. So a lot of plants, you know, when you get them, you're growing them indoors and they get kind of wispy and spindly because they don't have to grow nice and sturdy because there's no wind in your house. So when you go to plant them or put them outdoors or plant them outdoors, they flop over really easy a lot of times because they haven't been, you know, they haven't been used to that. They're not used to that at all. So if you give them a little bit of wind while they're growing inside your house, it helps with the turgidity of the plant. It helps with the, it makes it a little more rigid and sturdy, so when you go to put them outside, it's a sturdier, healthier plant to get, it's already kind of acclimated to some conditions outdoors. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got a question for you. Yeah. So, what if you 
starting to see the jiffy pot. Yeah. Can you still push them down in there? Yep, same thing. You just split open the pot or just push it down? No, you're just going to push it down in the soil. That, 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 this potting soil is nice and light and fluffy. Uh, that's that's the good thing about it. It gives you a nice or a fluffy mix to you're start the ritzing. Little disc guys. Oh, those little discs, yeah. yeah. Well, I never tried it on these. <laughs> You can try to push it down a little bit if you can. This is mostly peat moss. This is like a spongy mix peat moss. You can try to push them down there if you can, but it's going to be a little harder to do on these guys. But I'm sure it will work. Can you take one of those once mm -hmm. the plant starts growing and put it in one of these other? other That's the other thing you can do is take this whole thing and plant it into one of these pots, just deeper, and just go from there. Would be the better thing to do, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. So. So now you get them up into, you get them out of this situation or into the, you know, into the bigger pot situation. Or if you started them in something like this, again, you can go ahead and push them down. Just get them, give them a sturdier plant. Um, so there's a time you can do a little bit of fertilizing as well. What I always recommend is anytime you transplant anything from one place to another, here to here, here to your, here to the garden, here outside, anywhere. Anytime you transplant anything, you can use something like this. This is called plant starter. It's a liquid form. You mix in with your uh, with some water in this you know, watering can, and this is a granular form. It's an organic uh, starting mix as well. This these contain the hormones that help the plant overcome that transplant shock, helps the plant you know get started and growing uh, from that point. It also has a little bit of fertilizer in it. This is like a 3103. Uh, so that middle number is uh, phosphorus that helps with especially with root growth, and this has a little bit of fertilizer in it as well. Gives a little bit of shot to grow. You don't need a lot of fertilizer at this point. The goal is not to grow a giant plant in your house. The goal here is to grow, is to get the plant started, uh, off to a healthy, good start, and get it outside, and then it can grow and do a nice big plant once you get it outdoors. So if you're going to use something more like a balanced fertilizer, uh, like a miracle Grow or something like that, just use like a half strength. Whatever the directions say, just use a half strength on your seedlings. If you, want to, if you do a full strength, you might end up uh, burning some of the, the plants off that way. So you, want, you, want, you don't want to use the full strength. But this is like a, weak, a pretty weak solution in here, so this doesn't matter. You can use this on anything. Anytime you transplant anything, use these guys. So. What if you're going to leave the plants in the larger? You started in a larger pot, uh -huh. you're going to leave it in there? Yeah. So you get it outside? Do you then at some point start putting that fertilizer in? Yes. Yes, you can certainly put some of this on anyway. It just helps. It's just a little bit of fertilizer either way. It, mm -hmm. Sure can. All right. Anything, and then um, then we got to worry about how we're going to get these things outdoors. So now you've transplanted them. You start them in your seed pack. You transplant them up indoors. You've got a nice sturdy growth on them. Okay. Now it's you're getting to the middle of May, where you, you want to get them outdoors. Got them acclimated outdoors. Well, we still have a lot of different variables outdoors that aren't indoors. We don't. Have, there's no wind in your house, and there's no vast temperature changes in your house. I assume you don't, your house doesn't drop down to 30 degrees at night. I assume you keep it at a normal temperature. So um, you need to acclimate them to those kind of conditions. So again, the fan helps with the turgidity part, and you have the wind part. Um, if you can get, you know, there's some nice days that happen, you know, late April, early May, like this. There's a nice day like this. You can get them outside. Best thing to do though is to not put them in the full blazing sun right away. Best thing to do is put them in a, either a shadier spot uh, up against your house or at least just a little bit of morning sun is fine the first couple of days. Bring them back inside. You know, if you have a cold snap or something like that, bring them back inside. If it stays warm outside, leave them out there. Um, then slowly, gradually move them over to where a situation where they're in a sunnier location. Um, so they can get adapted to full sun that way. So that way they're not, you're not putting them straight out into the full sun uh, right off the bat because they can get the sun scorched and such right away if you do that too quickly. So that, again, that's a good benefit of starting in your cold frame because you're already outside already. It's already more, more used to the sun at that point. Um, so again, yeah, put them, you know, move them in and out so you're tr uh, reducing that shock. And uh, just monitor your plants. Uh, for things, um, you know, again, there's things outside that aren't inside your house. So there's things outside like um, hungry mice and those kind of things that want to dive and, uh, or chipmunks are just popping out of their little burrows or out of their hibernation. They like to dig in their little pots because guess what? You, you put up a nice little situation for them, a nice little loose soil for them to dig in. 
So they always come and dig in my pots, which I don't really, <laughs> really like with it. So there's a, you know, you can use different types of repellents and stuff like that to keep them away from your plants. But um, young plants are, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll grow fairly quickly once we get some decent temperatures. Um, most all plants do their actual physical growing at night. So they, what they're doing is actually they're collecting their energy from the sun during the day. And so while we, when they're all sleeping and we all go to bed at night, that's when their plants actually do their physical growing. Um, so they need decent night temperatures to, um, for them to grow. So if we have temperatures down you know, below 45 at night, we want to make sure to bring them back inside for those, for those nights. Um, if we have some, you know, a couple of warm days in a row, you can leave them outside then. It's better to keep them outside and get more acclimated to the real temperatures outdoors. Okay. And then uh, once you get them, want to plant stuff outdoors, um, there's things you can use um, that can help with uh, extending our season a little bit. Um, if you're ambitious and want to plant some of your tomatoes or peppers and stuff out early, like in early May, like some people do, um, we have options like frost cloth or frost caps. Um, that you can put thing, you know, put over your plants, or just a just a sheet or something like that to cover your plants. Anytime the you know the temperature drops below that 45 degree mark is is bad for any of the tropical plants you want to grow. Um, and or again, you can start things in a cold frame that has a lid on it that you can uh, open and close depending on the temperature. As well, um, once we get once you get everything outdoors and outside. Um, uh, you know, you can always pass along your, your seedlings and such to, to friends and neighbors as well if you have too many. Um, you know, the one disadvantage sometimes is, again, I end up with too many plants because you end up starting with a lot of seeds from, you know, there's 50 seeds in a packet sometimes and I have all these plants. I'm not sure to do with them all. So you have a lot of extra plants sometimes to give away to your friends and neighbors and such. Um, one thing I also want to tap, tap on real quick is before we go is just um, you can keep seeds from year to year. So if you're going to use things like vegetables to keep, you want to keep seeds you know, for next year or you want to keep some flower seeds for next year, you can do that very easily. Let's say you have a tomato plant, uh, you have a pepper plant that's growing really robust tomatoes and a really good flavor, good texture, everything. You're like, oh, I, really like these, I really like these tomatoes. I want to keep the tomato seeds for next year. Uh, what you have to do is make sure that the, the fruit itself, so the tomato or the pepper, ripens completely on the plant. You have to leave it on the plant as long as possible, almost to the point where the, the plant is, you know, the fruit is overripe. It's getting to the point where it's super dark red or the, or the pepper is really dark red. Um, that way that you know that the seed is matured inside that plant. Uh, if you want to keep it for next year, best thing you could do is um, pick, that, pick that tomato or pepper and get all the seeds out and put it on a paper towel in a, in a dry location in your garage or something like that where I put them. Um, make sure that the seeds dry out completely and then you can store them for next year in a nice cool dry place um, usually the basement's fine uh, where it doesn't uh, completely freeze and such uh, it'll be a good place to store them and make sure they don't get any moisture uh, in them because they can start germinating or rotting in that way um, that way you'll have some seeds for next year's seed starting so um, that's pretty much that's pretty much all I have today for seed starting if you have any uh, any questions at all yeah go ahead <laughs> yes, uh, the very, very tiny seeds, like from the patients and stuff mm -hmm. like that, I always get told later, mm -hmm. so the 210, the extra 210, would it be better to start with that kind of soil first? Yes, um, and every seed, you know, every seed pack is a little different. Everyone's got some have a better germination rate than others do. Um, you'll have to just kind of do the best you can with this. The soil doesn't matter as much as, as those seeds are so fine, you just want to make sure that they have uh, enough light hitting them because the light is what actually helps to germinate those. And they take a little longer time to germinate. They take like, up to two weeks sometimes to germinate. So you just got to be more patient with those as well. Uh, but I don't think the soil makes a huge difference because we, we started in either soil, really. And it works fine, so, yes. Can you use a mushroom compost in the, your, your vegetable garden? Uh, once you get them outside in the vegetable garden, yes, you can use mushroom compost too. Yeah. Is it okay to uh, use the fresh mushroom compost when you're planting the, uh, the plants in the actual garden? Yes, uh, you want to plant directly in the compost if you can avoid it. You want to you just want to mix it into the existing soil around it and then okay. plants into that as well. Okay. Um, you don't want to use any type of compost or garden soil for seed starting just because that's going to compact very easily in your containers. That's why we use the lightest, fluffiest mix possible to start with. Okay. But, I mean, uh, I mean, 
Uh, onion plants or the onion sets? No, onion, onion plants. Onion plants? Yeah. I would wait uh, usually probably the end of the month or so here. We have some, we have some started already here actually, so yeah, but end of the month, yeah. Because those, those can go in earlier because they don't mind cool temperatures. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so would you, you plant down? Do you cover the first set of leaves in the dirt, or do you leave them right? You right know, leaves? you're trying to get to this point here, where that first that kind of leading section comes out here, like that. That's where you, that's your your bond point. You, it's, you can kind of see them on here a little pretty vividly. So would it be above the ground then? So this is like your kind of leadings right here, and this is your first set of leaves. So you have this whole space right here to bury. But do you submerge the first set of leaves? No. Okay. Now you go from here to here. So your soil depth is right here, where that first set of cotyledons is coming out. Okay, so it, it would still, it would still yeah. be exposed. Right? Once, once you, if you bury up past this point, if you bury, if you start burying up here, then you're going to get rotting issues because this, this is where your crown of your plant starts, where the, where those cotyledons, that first set of leaf, that first set is right there, that's, uh, that's where the crown of your plant is. That's where it's going to start growing and, and it's like the base of your plant from. So you don't want to bury that because when, when you bury that crown, you can get some uh, rotting issues a lot easier. So, so make sure you just make sure you top. keep it right up yeah, here to here is your depth, and that's it. So you have to have a pot that when big. When you try out your yes. seeds, hmm? um, sorry, I'm yeah. holding my hand. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, when you try out the tomato seeds, mm -hmm. can you put them in a baggie in the refrigerator or in a glass jar, or do they have to go in a freezer that has a dryer? I usually keep, you know, I honestly, I let them dry out on a paper towel, and I just keep them on that paper towel, because that will wick away any excess moisture. I fold over the paper towel a couple times, and you can put it wherever you want at that point. That kind of thing, just to, to keep it dry over the winter, yeah. Yes. Uh, Cone flowers, do you know if the seeds have to be stratified or stratified? Yes, they do best if they are stratified, or uh, stratified, yes. Um, if you can put them in a, any type of container like this, uh, and, and put the soil over the top of them and just put this in the fridge for the winter or keep them in your garage if it's unheated for the winter, that, that does the job right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. So with the transplanting, you actually have to have a pot that, that tall in order to... Yes. Well, the goal is, uh, the goal would be also, like these I probably left a little too long in these, in these pots because they're out here in the light. They don't have extra light on them. So if these had some extra light on them, they wouldn't have gotten to this point. So I would maybe transplant it once once they got to here, kind of thing. Oh. Uh, try to get them before they get out of out of hand. I guess is what it, the best thing to say. So yes, in the back. In the long run, yes. In the short run, no. In the long run, it adds you know more salt to the to the water system. Um, it doesn't allow the plant to take up a, as many nutrients and, and such as it normally would. Uh, but in the short one, for this, no, it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, it's mm -hmm. um, it, there, there's not really a firm and fast rule, but the the best best garden you can have would have a good 18 inches of topsoil. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's best if you can. Well, uh, putting the raised bed over it will kill the grass anyway. Um, but yeah, um, do you need to kill it first with some chemical or something? No, not necessarily. Um, I would just put down like a layer of newspaper or something first. It's just to get it, get it to, to rot uh, first, and then once that once you get to that point, um, if you if you're Soil underneath has is really poorly drained. If it's really hard clay and that such, um, yeah, I'd probably want to go ahead and uh, get some of that uh, that top layer of sod off and just add some extra sand or something or gravel just to get a, a better base of drainage. But if it if it does if it drains fine, then you don't have to know. Yeah. What else? Yes. Um, I took some seeds just out of a really sweet pepper or. Mm -hmm. Anything you buy in the store, unfortunately, they buy, you pick that fruit before it's ripe. 